Well, I'm excited to be, be with you tonight, offering part seven of our Catechesis Introduction to Orthodoxy series. This is tonight's lesson is entitled Liturgy Alive and Tradition. And two weeks ago, we began introducing the idea of holy tradition. And in discussing tradition, we dared to define it as the life of the Spirit in the church, renewed in every generation. And we heard that this word literally means the passing down or the handing over of something. It literally refers to the proclamation of Jesus Christ that is passed down or handed down in the church from generation to generation. So it's, it's this very important part of our understanding of our church life. Holy tradition is the authority in our church. And it has, as we have been expressing last week and before, it has five I identify five aspects of it. We could break it down different ways. But five aspects of that tradition that we're looking at carefully over these catechetical lessons. The first thing, the Holy Scriptures, the Bible, which sort of functions as the crown jewel. Uh, we have the liturgy, that is the corporate prayers of the people of God. We have the church councils, including both the creeds, conciliar definitions of dogma, and also the disciplinary canons, about the life of the church, how, and we'll talk about that next week. Also, uh, saints, not only their, their teachings, which are very important, their writings, their, their homilies, their reflections, but also the accounts of their lives, which tell us how they lived and describe their journeys. Uh, and then finally, we have the, the category of church art, which includes icons, vestments, church architecture, and church music. Um, and tonight we're talking about liturgy. Any questions for me before we plow into tonight's lesson? Any clarifications from last week? Who was here last week? I was. Okay. All right. So what is liturgy? That's one example of liturgy, slide four. Uh, I like this picture. I like this picture because the liturgy, it, it, it signifies, it refers to the work of the people. It is an offering of everybody. And I, I want to include the clergy because the clergy are part of that. But this picture is nice because you see the laity gathered around the bishop. And, and <laughs> one of the features about the hierarchical service, the bishop service, is that the bishop's in the middle and everyone clusters around the bishop. It does. Uh, symbolizing the, the, the place of the bishop as the, as the local representative of unity in our, in our community. So... And the priest does that in a secondary sense. But when the bishop's there, we see... This is a picture from Carpetho Rus, which is a part of Ukraine, uh, from whence, actually, the founding fathers and mothers of the OCA came. These are our people that began... Karl Lizak's family, these are his people in the hills. It's the, it's the Carpathian mountain area between Ukraine, Poland, um, and... Slovakia, that How whole area. How long does the liturgy take with all those bishops? I have no idea. <laughs> it shouldn't take much. It, liturgy shouldn't take much longer. What would take longer is Holy Communion. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. You know, and depending on how many chalices you have, that would be the challenging part. So, so um, liturgy refers to the common work of the people, um, and it has to do very much with offering. We offer God our worship. We offer Him uh, our life. Um, I've told the story many times in sermons and in classes before. I had a woman when I lived in Petersburg who was like an aunt to me, and she looked after me. And I met her at, I met her at church school. We had a church school class together. And um, she helped me when I didn't understand. I asked her, I asked her to explain things afterwards. I, as I said, I don't understand what happened. And she'd tell me. And we, we would go get, we, we would visit together, and we would, she had me over to eat. And um, she took me on a couple of pilgrimages as well. And one day we went to the church of St. Seraphim of Sarov for his summer feast day in, um, in St. Petersburg. And it was a big celebration. And when I was there, I said to her, I said, let me buy you some candles. And she bristled at me and said, you can't buy me candles. I said, why not? I have lots of money. I'm American. You know? <laughs> And I didn't say it that way, but that's what I was thinking. And she looked at me and said, she said, no, I must spend my own money. I must make offering to God myself. You can't do that for me. And that, that taught me a big lesson that day. And whenever we are with God and we're worshiping God, we have to offer him our worship. 
And it might not be money. It, it should be money most of the time, honestly. It should be, it should be something that we give God that's sacrificial. It, it should be our time. Our, certainly, orthodoxy requires our energy because we have to stand for a very long time. You know, we have to cross ourselves. We bow. You know, in Lent, we literally fall on the ground and we kneel and prostrate before the Lord. Um, at home, we pray. We give God our energy. And, you know, when we're tired, Alana, you can attest that we don't want to stand. You know, we don't want to just, just, just stay on guard. We want to fall asleep. Um, I know this. You know this. So, um, but our, our worship has to cost something. And we find these examples in the Old Testament where worship is very costly. Um, consider Abel and Cain. Uh, Abel makes an offering that is extremely costly. These, these sheep that he has. Cain offers God some pieces of fruit. You know, and there's a big difference there. Uh, Noah, uh, Noah, when he arrives at his destination and disembarks, the first thing he does, he sacrifices one of these precious animals that he's been carrying in his ark to, to the Most High God. He gives that to God as first fruits. When the patriarchs accomplish anything, they build an altar, they mark a, pl- a place, they name a place, and they make a sacrifice. Um, Moses and Aaron receive this order of worship from God himself. That involves blood and burnt offerings and wheat offerings and grain offerings. Um, And this continues all the way through Solomon, uh, first temple, second temple, even to Jesus' day. And even Psalms like Psalm 50, Psalm 51, um, it presupposes that we're we're offering God stuff. And it doesn't make sense to offer him burnt offerings. It doesn't make sense unless we're actually offering him stuff anyway. He wants a clean heart from us, but it presupposes other offerings too. In that case, whole burnt offerings, bullocks on the altar. But, but again, this is part of our DNA as Orthodox believers, this idea of offering to God. Um, and in, in the book of Acts, chapter 2, we see the newly baptized continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in the prayers, doing the prayers as a sacrifice and they continued daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house. This was the way they lived. They continued in the same mentality in the early church. So, um, you have a question? What's the Greek word for um, the prayers? Was it liturgion or something? Or was it was that in a different context? Um, oh, um, oh gosh. In, in the actual New Testament there? Yeah. In the prayers... Um, oh, um, F key, okay. F key, which is which is the book for the priest service book, is oh, the is the is the prayer book F Kologion. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. So but I I think my memory is right on that. I don't have my New Testament in front of me, but um, so all the sacrifices exist to lead us to the one sacrifice and the one priest, Jesus. So all of these things in the old covenant. St. Paul teaches us very clearly, uh, and Hebrews teaches us very clearly, right? The book of Hebrews, that um, there's one offer and one offering, and Jesus is he's the offer and the offering. In the liturgy, we say, um, we say this exactly. You are the offer, you are the offer. The priest says this in a, in a silent prayer in the liturgy. And so um, the prototype then is seen all over the Old Covenant, and even in our, our sacrifices to God, or a type of his offering, but he's the prototype, Jesus Christ. So um, the rites of our church, that is the worship of Christians, was at the heart of what they did and how they lived their lives. In the early church, sacrifice uh, for the church in general, sacrifice is fulfilled in the cross of Jesus. And the question then is, how do we Christians participate in the sacrifice of Christ? How do we enter into it? And, and the church has always been clear. St. Paul says, as many as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. We baptize. Whoa. This is a real baptism in Russia. This is slide number six. Wow. And that poor boy getting baptized in winter time. Isn't that amazing? Look, look at the priest. <laughs> <laughs> oh my word, his heart's coming off. Oh my that is an action shot. Isn't that great? Oh, I love that. I think it's risking really dying. I mean, <laughs> what if they drop the boy in the water, right? But anyway, that poor priest could fall in too. I'm so they know how to. So, so yes. You've got the type upon him. We, we participate by, by baptism. <laughs> because we believe, literally, in baptism, we die with Christ. Yeah. And we rise again. The old man dies, 
And this, is, this will distinguish our view of baptism. I'm, I'm really speaking to, to you guys down there who ha- have a, ba- a background in, in evangelicalism. You know, I know in most evangelical traditions, baptism is just a symbol. But for the Orthodox, there's something mystical that happens. We pray exorcism prayers over the water. We, we, we spend an hour over that water praying before we put the person in. And something happens akin to, for us, the mystery of circumcision. But now it's, it's deeper than just the flesh. It's, it's, it's both a sign of God's grace, but also a commitment to the community of faith. So it, it has all these different layers. I mean, it is a symbol, of course. It has symbolic meaning. But it, it, it signifies, in a very real sense, our death into Christ, our being risen with him again, our entry into the sacramental participation of the community of Christians. You could not take communion. You were not a Christian in the early church unless you were baptized. You could, you could have, a, have an experience of God, but you were not allowed to receive Holy Communion permitted to unless you had been baptized first. The only exception would be if someone's martyred in their own blood. That was considered a baptism. Uh, other than that, this is the way into the church, period, end of story. So, um, also, sacramentally, we, 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 offer him our, we offer him ourselves in the Eucharist. Think about the Eucharist. We make the bread, we prepare the wine, we give, we, we give that to God in the liturgy, so we give him something. We offer him the very word for the bread uh, in the Orthodox Church is the prospera. Prospera literally means the offering. So the bread is what we offer, and we give it to him. He blesses it. It becomes Eucharist. It becomes the body and blood of Jesus for us. And then he, so we give him something, and he multiplies the loaves and gives it to us. And that's why the early Christians always loved those multiplication of loaves pa- passages. In the New Testament, because they, they saw them as inherently Eucharistic, these were about these were about what happens on Sunday. Elijah, God blesses the loaves, but we give them something like the little boy did with two fishes, right, and the breads. We and that's why in the in the right, it's five loaves. It's five loaves, not four or ten. It's five loaves we offer him. I add two sometimes because you do that as well. I want to have more, but but I I do five main ones. So. For you, Chris, it goes beyond just. Like increasing the quantity is that for it's, transformation. It is, but we have to offer him something. Yes, we can't yes. offer him nothing, yes. and that's the point. Um, other sacraments of life, we have we have holy monasticism, right? That's a way to give of oneself. Uh, you, in, in the monastic tonsure, it's this incredibly martyric um, um, so right. Mm-hmm. That's Zoe so visiting the nuns. These are the nuns who came to our parish when Gabriel died. So and over here, um, I, I don't know if you actually saw the video. I hope you didn't. But this is a video from two years ago where I think 12 Christian men no, were was, martyred. it was 21. Was it 21? No, it was 22. Well, there was one of them who was Muslim, and he said right. he the, confessed the, Christ. The, 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 the dark one there was from South, southern sub-Sahara, and he became a Christian yes, in the midst of that. Yes, he confessed Christ. But this is ways in which we participate in the sacrifice of Christ. And also... That? This is another kind of sacrifice, parents, mm. right? You have to <laughs> deal with the kids. No, I'm serious. You know, think, I, I mean, I know for my children, I give up a lot to, keep, to teach them the faith and to live with them. Your mother gives up a lot for you, Bethany. Yes, you know, you guys with your kids, it's really tough. You'll find this out one day. You'll want to scream. you want to become a monk, perhaps. <laughs> I've thought that before. Becoming a monk would be a lot easier than having kids because you've got to deal with this stuff, right? So, um, but all these things are ways you participate in the sacrifice of Jesus. We enter, we meet him in in the in the cross. We meet him in the darkness, and he he multiplies the loaves. He multiplies our genetic material. <laughs> he gives us life from these things. So, um, switching gears now to talk about liturgy specifically, as we know it in the church, one of the best and earliest examples of of explaining liturgy to non-Christians is St. Justin the Martyr. He lives, he was born a pagan in about the year 100 in Syria. So he, he was born about the year the Apostle John died, just to give you some perspective. He lived through most of the second century. He dies uh, at, at Rome in 165. Um, he converted to Christianity uh, with a very strong Greek, Hellenic, philosophical mind. He was a Stoic. He was a peripatetic he might have been a monarchy, I forget. He, he did a lot of different things. He was very interested in knowledge and learning and truth. He was a truth seeker. 
And tradition says that he continued to wear the philosopher's garb even after he was a Christian. He saw it as his mission to take, to take the intellectual tradition of, of Christianity and bring it to, to the philosophical world and make it mutually comprehensible. So that was his mission. That's what he did. Um, he, his, his theology is not always perfect. Um, many, many contemporary, many later saints would say, in fact, that he taught semi-Arianism. But he's a saint. He died a martyr of the church. His theology is not impeccable. It's a, he's a good example of a saint who's very, very important, whose testimony is sure, but whose theology is not without fault. And it's important that we have that mind as we look at the church fathers. We don't imagine they're infallible. Very important. So we'll talk about the fathers uh, next week. Um, so, but let's keep going. Um, at, at one point... Uh, he writes. He writes two sets of apologies: one to the Roman authorities, one to the Jews. He's trying to convince the Jews to convert to the Christian faith. He's an apologist uh, for Christianity vis-à-vis the Jewish communities. And in one of his apologies, uh, he relates this about baptism. This is a baptistry from Dura Europis in Iraq, from the, from the second century. Um, but there it is. You see it. Uh, these pieces are all original pieces that have been reconstructed in this museum. Uh, the museum's at Yale, by the way. But these are real pieces from that area, um, from the second, from the, from the time of St. Justin Martyr. He says this, I will relate the, ma- the manner in which we did- dedicated ourselves to God when we had first been made new through Christ. Lest, if we omit this, we seem to be unfair in the explanations we are making. As many as are persuaded and believe that what we teach and say is true and undertake to be able to live according to our teaching. These are instructed to pray and to entreat God with fasting for the remission of their sins that are past. And we pray also fast with them. This is the origin of Lent, by the way. Then they are brought by us where there is water and they are regenerated in the same manner in which we ourselves were regenerated. For in the name of God, the Father and Lord of the universe, of our Savior Jesus Christ and of the Holy Spirit, they then receive the washing with this water. For Christ said, except ye be born again, ye shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now that is impossible for those who have once been born to enter into their mother's wombs. This is manifest to all. And how those who have sinned and repent shall escape their sins. This is declared by Isaiah the prophet who said this, Wash you, make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from your souls. Learn to do well. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. And come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. And though your sins be like scarlet, I will make them white like wool. Though they be as crimson, I will make them white as snow. But if ye refuse and rebel, the sword shall devour you, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. That's all Isaiah there. And then he continues. For this right we have learned from the apostles, this reason, this is why we have this ritual. Since at our birth we were born without our knowledge or choice, by our parents coming together, and were brought up in bad habits and wicked training, in order that we may not remain the children of necessity and of ignorance, but may become children of choice and knowledge, and may obtain in the water the remission of sins formerly committed, there is pronounced over him who chooses to be born again, who has repented of his sins in the name of God the Father and the Lord of the universe, he who leads to the laver the person who is to be washed, calling him by name alone the Christian name. For no one can utter the name of the ineffable God, and if anyone dare to say that there is a name, he raves with a hopeless madness. And this washing we call illumination, because they who learn these things are illumined in their understandings. In the name of Jesus Christ, who was crucified under Pontius Pilate, in the name of the Holy Ghost, and who through the prophets foretold all things about Jesus, this person is illuminated and washed. St. Justin continues... Uh, in his first apology. But we, <clears throat> but we, after we have thus washed him who has been convinced and has assented to our teaching, the Christian teaching, we bring him to the place where those who are called brethren are assembled in order that we may offer hearty prayers in common for ourselves and for the baptized illuminated persons and for all others in every place. We may be counted worthy now that we have learned the truth by our works, but also be found good citizens and keepers of all the commandments, that we may be saved with an everlasting salvation. Having ended the prayers, 
we then salute each other with a kiss. So we baptized, and now we, we greet each other with a holy kiss. Then is brought to the president, the presider of the assembly, a cup of bread and a cup of wine mixed with water. And he, taking them, gives praise and glory to the Father of the universe through the name of the Son and the Holy Ghost, and offers thanks at considerable length for our being counted worthy to receive these things from his hands. When he's concluded these prayers with thanksgivings, all people present give their assent by saying, Amen. This word, Amen, answers in the Hebrew language to, to genito, which is so be it in Greek. And when the president has given thanks and all the people assembled have expressed their assent, those who are called by us deacons give to each of those present to partake of the bread and wine mixed with water over which the thanksgiving was pronounced. And those who are absent may carry away a portion for themselves. And this food we call among us the Eucharist, of which no one is allowed to partake but the man who believes that the things we teach are true who has been washed with the washing that is for the remission of sins unto regeneration, who is so living as Christ has enjoined. For not as common bread and common drink do we receive these things, but in like manner as Jesus Christ our Savior, having been made flesh by the word of God, had both flesh and blood for our salvation. So likewise have we been taught that the food which is blessed by the prayer of his word, and from which our blood and flesh by transmutation are nourished, is the very flesh and blood of that Jesus who was made flesh for us. For the apostles in the memoirs composed by them, called the Gospels, have thus delivered unto us what was enjoined upon them, saying that Jesus took bread, when he given thanks, said, This do ye in remembrance of me, this is my body. And that, after the same manner, having taken the cup and given thanks, he said, This is my blood. And he gave it to them alone. Which the, wicked, which the wicked devils have imitated in the mysteries of Mithras, commanding the same thing to be done. For that bread and cup of water are placed with certain incantations of the mystic rites of one who is being initiated. You can either know or can learn. What, what he's saying is the rites of Mithras that are so well known, these are demonic um, mutations of the Christian ritual, which is pure and not, it is not blood of beasts and goats and calves, rather it is, the, it is the, the wine and the bread that we believe become mystically the body and blood of Jesus. Um, and another place he will defend the Christians against two charges. One of the charges is that they're cannibals because people believed they ate, they talk about eating the blood, body and blood of Jesus. Well, that sounds pretty cannibalistic, doesn't it? Well, they used the word for Jesus that was pious, the child. Uh... So, so maybe. They thought the pagans thought that there was a rumor going around the pagans that what Christians did was they put a baby in a bag of flour and then beat it to death and ate it. And ate it. So, uh, and one of the words for Jesus in the religious was they called him the child of God at times, yeah. Um, the, other, the other thing that the uh, pagans accused them of, of being of being incestuous. Yes. Uh, and they called each other brother and sister. And, sister and, and so. Um, I'll continue here with St. Justin a little bit more about the weekly worship rites because it's, it's very interesting. Again, remember, this is the year probably 150 when he's writing this. And we afterwards continually remind each other of these things and the wealthy among us help the needy and we always keep together for all things wherewith we are supplied. We bless the maker of all through his son, Jesus Christ and through the Holy Ghost. And on the day called Sunday, all who live in cities and in the country gather together in one place and the memoirs of the holy apostles or the writings of the prophets are read as long as time permits. Then when the reader has ceased, the presider verbally instructs and exhorts us to the imitation of these good things. Then we all rise together and we pray. As we said before, when our prayer is ended, bread and wine and water are brought and the presider in like manner offers prayers and thanksgivings or Eucharist, literally, according to his ability. And the people give their assent saying, Amen. And there is a distribution of each of these things and a participation of that over which thanks has been given. And to those who are absent, a portion is sent by the deacons. And they who are well to do and willing give what each thinks fit. They give money. And what is collected and deposited with the president who then gives help to the orphans and widows and those who do sickness or any cause or in want and those who are in bonds and the strangers sojourning among us and in a word, it takes care of all those people who are in need. 
But Sunday is the day on which we hold our common meeting, because it is this first day on which God, having wrought a change in the darkness and matter, made the world. And Jesus Christ, our Savior, on that same day, rose from the dead. For he was crucified on that day, the day before that of Saturn, that is, he died on Friday, and on the day after Saturn, which is the day of the sun, he appeared to his apostles and disciples, risen. He taught them these things which we have submitted to you for your consideration. Um, I'm going to show you now um, a video from my favorite seminary. Oh, wait. No, no. This is a video here. I was going to show it earlier. I skipped over it. I was so into the reading. This is a, a little excerpt from the catacombs in Rome. Uh, underneath St. Peter's are still the catacombs where the Christians gathered. And the Pope very kindly lets the Orthodox serve liturgy down there pretty regularly. And uh, I have several friends who've been down there to serve as priests. Uh, but this is uh, one of the Greek bishops uh, serving liturgy. But it's, well, I'm going to show you two videos here. This one and then, and then the, one of the Liturgy of St. James. And in both of these liturgies, what is really neat is you see how the church worshipped in an earlier period. This is, this is our current ritual, but it's very simplified and, and you see people gathered around the table almost. And when you see the Liturgy of St. James, you'll see the iconostas, but the, the ritual and the, even the vestments have been adapted to look as they looked uh, in, in perhaps the 3rd century or 4th century. So, really 4th century. But uh, I'll, I'll stop here and I, might, I, can, I can stop it more and explain. But here are the two videos now. I was just asked the question of, did having watched the videos of um, the catacomb liturgy and then the liturgy of St. James in St. Petersburg, the question was, did Jesus actually teach the apostles how to do all of that? And I think the short version of my answer would be, um, Jesus uh, gives them the Last Supper, right? And we know that. And if we imagine that that was a non-ritualized meal, we're insane. Now, there's debate as to whether that was the actual Passover or not. I think it probably wasn't the actual Passover. It was a preparation meal as part of that whole cycle of services, cycle of observance. And um, so there, there's ritualized everything. And if you look at the Passover meal, there's blessings over the cup. There's blessings over the, over the bread. There's order to it. What we know is that the early Christians, wherever they went, they celebrated the Eucharist. And... There, there was a clear idea that there was a presider who was appointed by the Holy Apostles to, 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 to offer the prayers over the gifts. And we know, too, that there was, a, <clears throat> there was a fusion in the early church, almost immediately, Bethany, between the synagogue worship on one hand and the temple worship. Mm -hmm. So you had, the synagogue worship focused on what? What was the main, the main event of that? Reading, reading, reading of the Torah. Yeah. Reading, reading of of the Old Testament scriptures and expounding upon them. And what happened in the temple? They sacrificed an animal. They sacrificed animals. It was a liturgical worship. Oh, and and wow. with, with the fall of the temple, um, in a real, it, well, not even, forget that, with, with, the, with, the, um, with the kicking of the Christians out of the synagogue, the Christians had to do their own thing for the worship. And with, with the final destruction of the temple in 70, that closed the door forever on any, any association with temple worship. And so all of these rituals get encrusted in the Christian faith as the divine liturgy, marrying the customs of the synagogue with the idea of offering and sacrifice fulfilled in Jesus now with, with the temple worship. But the Eucharist is that worship for us. And, and then everything else is an elaboration on that. Everything else is you take this basic, these basic pieces and then you add an extra reading, or you add these certain hymns, or the priest. Uh, tradition says that the early presbyters would wear a stole. That probably was their only vestment. They had a stole they'd wear, symbolizing like the old prophets of old, like a prayer shawl. You wore something to symbolize, and they even had tassels on it, like like the Jewish prayer shawls do. Um, our tassels symbolize um, the accountability of the presbyter for the souls of his congregation. You know. 
But anyway, yes, Alana. We also see in the in the structure of the divine liturgy, we see the marriage of the synagogue worship Absolutely. and the temple worship. Because Absolutely. the first half of the divine liturgy is the is the liturgy of the word, <clears> and <throat> then we shift over into the liturgy of the the gifts. And right. so there's that, that crossover after the homily, then, you know, the catechumens are kicked out and we have... The and that's, the, the, that's the marker. Yeah and, yeah, and so you see synagogue worship, temple worship with a sacrifice where only the inside crowd is allowed to participate. It's a mystery. Whereas in the synagogue worship, even among the Jews, there was the opportunity for the Gentiles to come and, and hear and be God-fearers. But not to but go not in. not to participate. No. Why? no. So, but see, there's that... That, that. Do, do you understand what she's saying? In, 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 our, in our liturgy, we, after the catechumen uh, litany, uh, the, the, the deacon or priest will say, let all catechumens depart, depart catechumens. That's the point where they kicked them out in the early church. And that directly mirrors the whole temple system where you had the inner mysteries were for the people of God. And then you had the priest on top of that too. But you had, how many courts did you have? You had a number of courts. Well, and Gentiles could go on one. And here's what we have here. We have the narthex, and and then we have and, and anyone Christian can worship, be there. In Christian worship, everything is one step closer. Right. So in the in the Jewish worship, the Holy of Holies, the priest could only go in there once a year. With Male the, Jewish priest. So, yeah. him and, so they could pull him out of God's yeah. and down. Now we have the sanctuary where the priest goes in and out all the time. The doors get open because right. the temple veil has been torn in two because of Christ's offering and now there's this free and open participation and so in the the outer court or the the next court from the the sanctuary was the holy place and that was where only where the, the priests priest. normally went and that corresponds now with our nave we're all baptized all Christians are welcome and then the, the entryway the narthex used to correspond where the people gathered mm-hmm. and now it's just the entryway. Well, but it was the traditional baptism place too. And then the women too. had to be out in the women's court. They couldn't even come that close. And beyond so that was the court of Gentiles, right? And beyond mm-hmm. that was the court of Gentiles. So the church all these has, gradations has all this. You know, the temple veil is torn in two. We've come forward. The royal doors open. The gifts come out. Christ comes out to us. And there's so much symbolism there. Exactly. And it is exactly the worship of the old covenant fulfilled in Christ. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes, but that was <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Any other questions before we keep going? How big was that church? Uh, that, uh, this one, the, 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 not very large, it's probably about three times the size of ours. Everybody comes down, though, because I saw it. There's a balcony? Like they come down for uh, Yeah, this particular church has a balcony in it, but it's not, it's two or three times as big as our church. No, it's a small church for for St. Petersburg, actually. This is kind of a random question, but um, in Western rites during communion services, usually arms are crossed if you don't if you want to receive a blessing, you don't want to uh-huh. receive a gift. That's Why true. Why in the divine liturgy is this what all the communicants do? In ancient times, this was the posture of of piety. You would hold your arms like this. I know in the Russian old rite, when you go to visit the churches, they stand like this the whole time. Wow. It's considered it's a way to be stand piously. Wow. I don't know. I don't know exactly if that's an, a universal Christian custom that got lost or not, but that was a custom surely in Russia a thousand years ago. So, um, and that the tradition has been at least Eleni in the Greek Church. They don't do that, do they? When they go to communion, do they cross their arms or no? I don't know. My Nuno always made me cross mine, but like I didn't do it normally. Well, so. her, Nuno being her godfather, so maybe it's a Greek thing too. I don't know. So, but when you go to communion in the Russian tradition, you always do this. And it's, it's a way to make the sign of the cross. Oh, people say Michael's do it. You make the sign of the cross by your arms being this way, and it shows humility. So, I think I've observed the Ethiopians doing it. The, okay. I think most of the people at St. Michael's approach the chalice like this. Yeah, that's normal. Okay. Because there wasn't, I didn't have a big break in, whoa, they don't do this here. Right. My observation of that was when I visited a Roman Catholic church, and I thought it was funny that if you're going to receive a blessing, you go like this, and if you're going to receive the Eucharist, you go like this. And, oh, and, that's and, and our church is exact opposite. Right. And I wondered if that was something that happened with the schism. No, no, no. I imagine, too, the Romans have been giving communion. It's a very reasonable thing to take it in your hand. Yeah. They didn't do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
And I don't think in the East we ever did that. No. We, we would always put it in the, put it in the mouth directly. Right. Not, if, um, not if the priest has so to we'll, we'll keep going, though. Yeah. Um, I, it was giving me conniptions when I visited a Catholic church out in Harrisburg. They were walking all around amongst the congregation, all these people walking around with, with the Eucharistic gifts. I just kept worried someone was going gonna to drop it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh wow. So, you know, I would just... Oh, I missed... Oh, here here we go. I just want to... I'm showing some images here. This is slides 15. Um, just, it's a reminder. Is it on? I have a question back on uh, the Eucharist. It's on. So, I wanted to mention that uh, these images, the synagogue here, um, these are from the first century. And this is just, just to illustrate visually that when we talk about the early church... This is the world they're coming out of, right? It's, it's full of imagery, full of color, full of ritual, full of liturgy. So when we talk about liturgy, I think we imagine that the early apostles did kumbaya and had a good time. But like, it, it was, it, what they did was the synagogue worship. It was the temple worship. It was in places like this. It looks like this, <laughs> you know? That's what they were doing, uh, more or less. So... Uh, it, it, no, this is actually an image of Yahweh defeating all of the evil pagan gods. Oh, nice. So uh, I, I'm not sure that's... I don't know who, if that's Yahweh. I, you can't make an image of Yahweh. No. But it's, these are all the pagan deities of Palestine being defeated. Oh, cool. So, anyway. Um, so you, you might recall the phrase, Lex Arande, Lex Credendi. This is important. We think of liturgy. The, the, the law of... Prayer is the law of faith. For us, how we pray is really important. We don't dare change our liturgy. It does evolve. It does morph a little bit here and there. But we don't consciously say, I'm going to reform the liturgy because the liturgy reforms us. Right? We don't reform the liturgy. The liturgy reforms us. That's our whole approach. And that, honestly, I'm not anti-Roman Catholic. If you know me, I love Romans. My kid goes to Roman Catholic school. My best friends are Roman Catholic. But this is a major problem we have with Rome. And as much as the filioque, I think this mentality where the Pope can tinker with things and change things, and it's, it's really Protestant. Because it, you're not submitting to the church. Uh, the ch- you're over the church. You're controlling. You're manipulating the church. And we find that very problematic. So for us, we are, we are being formed by the church, not forming it ourselves. So... Um, and, so... <laughs> Let, let's review here just in closing. We're almost done. Let's review in closing here the, the particular things in our liturgy and our services that are, are binding on the faithful. So we would say that all the sacramental services are in some way, we're bound by those texts. What they say about God and what baptism is and what's happening. These texts, if you want to know what we believe, go read the service book. It's all right here. I've got it in front of me. Anything in here, check it out. That's what we believe, right? This is it. This, is, this has baptism, marriage, the, all the liturgies in here. Read it. It's all there. It'll tell you. Um, we would also say that the actual liturgies of Chrysostom, Basil, presanctified gifts are absolutely core in our tradition. What they say there is what goes. Uh, we, would, we would say that our cycle of services, Vespers, um, Compline, Matins, these things reflect the authentic teaching of our church and are very, very important to us. We would also include uh, the various important festal books of our church, like the Lenten Triodion. This book is, is where all the Lenten services come from. And this is all the feast days. All of this, all these books, what's in here, this is what our church believes about God. And, and you might say, well, is that as important as the Bible? That's not the point. <laughs> It's, it's like saying, is, is my first son, is love like my second son? They're all good. They're all my children. They're all part of my family. It's in, incomprehensible to have one without the other. And for us, this is, this is the living fruit of 2,000 years of the Holy Spirit in our worship. It's been, it's been added to, it's been built on, but this reflects 2,000 years of living Holy Spirit right here. So, um, we would also... Anyway, I'll, I'll leave it there. So, um, I'm, in closing, I'm going to give some examples of how liturgy functions as a source of doctrine in Christian practice. For instance, um, 
Christ's passion and union with the other members of the Trinity is illustrated beautifully in the liturgy when the priest chants very quietly. He says, as he senses the altar, Jesus Christ in the tomb with the body, in hell with the soul, in paradise with the thief, on the throne with the Father and the Spirit was thou boundless Christ filling all things. So hear that again. Thou is about Jesus in the tomb with the body. He dies in hell with in Hades with the soul. He, he it descends to Hades. He dies in paradise with the thief on the throne with the Father and the Spirit. Was thou boundless Christ filling all things? It's a doxology about Jesus, and it tells you a lot, right? He is fully human. He suffers. He, he goes to preach in Hades. He knows paradise. He knows death. He knows the tomb. He's glorified with the Father and the Spirit. That tells you so much right there. And that's one sentence. You know, That's one rich sentence I just happened to pull out. Um, that's one example. Um, another, another prayer that, that I, I hear me summarize sometimes when I pray before this, certain, this class, it's a prayer before the gospel. It goes like this. And it tells you how we view the gospel and how we, how we view our interaction with the gospel. It, it goes like this. Illumine our hearts, O Master, who lovest mankind, with the pure light of thy divine knowledge, open the eyes of our mind to the understanding of thy gospel teachings, and plant also in our hearts the fear of thy blessed commandments, that trampling down every carnal desire, we may enter upon a spiritual manner of living, both thinking and doing the things well pleasing unto thee. For thou art the illumination of our souls and bodies, O Christ our God, and to thee do we send up glory with thy Father and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. So you hear all these elements in that prayer. Um, Christ not only teaches us, but he illumines us. And as we are illumined, we have the power to walk in righteousness. And as we walk in righteousness, we, we then can perceive the gospel better. All this is in that beautiful prayer. Um, we see it in the creed. Uh, we'll talk about the creed next week a lot. But the creed's part of liturgy. It's in the divine liturgy. It's in the baptismal service. Uh, we, we learn about how we view the dead by our prayer for the dead in the liturgy, which is not done every Sunday, but on a weekday or on a memorial day. I'll read the prayer for you. O God of spirits and of all flesh, who has trampled down death by death and overthrown the devil, who has given life to thy world, do thou, the same Lord, give rest to the souls of thy departed servants, names, in a place of brightness, a place of refreshment, a place of repose, where all sickness, sighing, and sorrow have fled away. Pardon every transgression which they have committed, whether of word or deed or thought. For thou art a good God who lovest mankind, because there is no man who lives yet does not sin. For thou only art without sin, and thy righteousness all generation, and thy word is true. For thou art the resurrection of our souls and bodies, O Christ our God. So um, we hear in that prayer all these things about God being good, about our prayers having meaning, about His will uh, is to have mercy on all. All these things are embedded in that prayer. Um, we learn of the real presence of the Eucharist, right? Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. Make this bread the precious body of Christ. We, we learn about the Theotokos, right, in, in the liturgy. Um, we learn about the saints. Um, in, in the wedding service, we see, I meant to have a picture, I ran out of time to get a nice photo of that. In the wedding, we crown the husband and the wife. And that symbolizes so many things, but among them it symbolizes their king and queen of their house. They are um, there to be holy, like the saints, with crowns. They're to die as martyrs to each other in everlasting uh, self-emptying. So um, all these things in our services point us to deep spiritual truths that are absolutely essential. And we can't say, well, mere Christianity would allow... No, mere Christianity includes all these things. It, for us, it does. And, um, and we, we, we value them very much as part of this beautiful, glorious crown right there. So, um, But I would emphasize that we are not fundamentalists with the liturgy and with the Bible. Um, it, it, one example of this I think is, and I'm going to go on a limb here, one, one of the examples of this, um, in Holy Week, there are texts about the Jews. Oh, wretched Jews. You know, you God killers, this kind of stuff. I, I think in a certain polemical sense, 
they're not totally off. I'm, and who am I to say? But I, 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 there are many really good theologians in our time who would say we ought not chant those in Holy Week because of the fruit of those, which can be hatred for the Jews. Right? You might recall 150 years ago in Russia there were pogroms during Holy Week, and Orthodox people heard these hymns and they ran out and they and they smashed Jewish shops and did terrible things. So um, it doesn't mean we can't we can't look at our tradition critically. I think we can and we ought to. Um, and, but just like with the Bible, we want to we want to look at it, we want to understand it, we want to see the history behind it, what was meant. Uh, I would contend the Holy Fathers in those passages are not being racialist; they're, they're, they're dealing with a heresy. That's in their mind; they're dealing with heresy, right? And so you speak truth to heresy. But unfortunately, people nowadays interpret that differently. So we have to get behind that sometimes, but understand. Jews so. nowadays can't be. I mean, they aren't doing any of that. We'll come, I'll talk to you after that if you want to a little bit about that. Um, next week we're going to talk about the councils, canons, and saints of our church alive in the tradition. So we'll have to cover a lot of ground next week, but hopefully we'll get it done in an hour. So God bless you all.